नमस्ते वेलकम टू द नेक्स्ट वीडियो ऑफ मशीन लर्निंग टेक्निक्स कोर्स इन दिस वीडियो विल कंटिन्यू विथ आर डिस्कशन ऑफ एब्स्ट्रैक्ट स्केच ऑफ द मशीन लर्निंग प्रोसेस वील लुक एट द लास्ट कॉम्पोनेंट ऑफ द प्रोसेस विच इज इवेल्युएशन द इवेल्युएशन ऑफ द ट्रेन मशीन लर्निंग मॉडल टू फिगर आउट वेदर द मॉडल हैज बीन ट्रेन एज पर आर एक्सपेक्टेशन एंड it is able to perform well on the unseen data so the model is evaluated on validation data after the training is complete we can use different metrics based on the problem type we take into account the metrics on validation examples for evaluating accuracy of the model we calculate both training and validation metrics and compare them for diagnostics related to overfitting or underfitting we have talked about these concepts briefly in the previous video there are different metrics for regression and classification problems the first and the simplest one to compare is the lost function between training and validation points we can observe the training loss and validation loss and make some diagnosis about the quality of the model let's look at the symptoms and diagnostics if the training loss is low and so is the validation loss it is just the right fit of the model here we know that the model has reached the lower lower loss on training set as well as validation set so it's a right fit of the model if the training loss is high and so is the validation loss both of them are high that's a sign of what is called as underfitting and if the training loss is low and validation loss is high it's a sign of what is called as overfitting here there is one more uh, one more criteria that we need to check out so what happens is that the training loss and validation loss both starts at high because that's where we do the random initialization of the parameter and because of the random initialization initially the losses will be high then as we start training the model both these losses will start coming down training loss as well as validation loss but after a point what will happen is training loss will continue to go down but validation loss will not go down but instead it will start going up and if that starts happening you know your model is overfitting the training data the model that underfits is unable to utilize the full power of the training data because the model itself does not have any capacity right and in case of overfitting the model has so much of excess capacity that model can pretty much memorize all the thing and reproduce it as it is in case of overfitted model it will perform very well on the training set but it may not perform that well on the validation set or on the future examples so let's look at overfitting with a practical example so you can see here overfitting uh, in terms of the model and in terms of the learning curves so it is not always possible for us to visualize this model whenever our data is in multi dimensional space or where you have let's say more than one feature in the model then it is very hard for you to uh, you know uh, plot such kind of curves and check for the overfitting at that time learning curves are our best friends to figure out what is happening with the model so here you can see that the the green points are the training examples and the model is uh, shown by the red line right you can see here that this model is literally connecting the points one after the other right so it's a very complex model uh, so this model is kind of overfitting right because it is exactly uh, it has almost remember the training data and it is just connecting the dots so if we give any points which is slightly away from the example then it will not be able to predict the value for that correctly okay and here what you can see is initially both the training and validation losses they started uh, high because uh, we initialize the models with random weights and because of random weights initially the loss is generally high then you know after some iteration training loss starts coming down and so is the validation loss it, it came down gradually and after a point training loss continue to reduce validation loss stopped reducing 
and in fact it is now it may go in the upward direction so if this is happening you know that the model is actually overfitting let's look at the example of overfitting with a general scenario right so remember our example of kids giving exams right so here the example of overfitting in that context is when the kids are given a question bank for a topic and then instead of you know studying any other parts of the syllabus the kids only prepare questions from the question bank they don't learn anything outside of that and when that happens they'll be able to answer questions only from the question bank right but if you ask any question which was not there in the question bank then kids may fail to answer that question right so this is like overfitting to the questions in the question bank got it so this is one of the practical example to understand what overfitting is now let's look at another phenomenon which is underfitting in case of underfitting what happens is again you know we have a model on the left and we have learning curves on the right and you can see that uh, the the data points are again represented by green points and model is red line right so now what what is happening is model is not able to fit the training data properly right so we have a line with we have a very simple model which is a line which is not able to fit all the points correctly and that is also reflected in the learning curve so you can see that again both the both training and validation losses they started on high loss because of again random initialization of the parameters but then after few epochs they are just not coming down right i mean they came down slightly but just stayed flat uh, over there right so because of this right so what you can conclude from this learning curve is that both training and validation losses are high that means the model is underfitting model does not have enough capacity to learn the pattern in the data again we will take the example of kids giving exam in the context of underfitting and try to explain it right so here the underfitting would mean is the kids ignore the questions right kids just do not pay any attention to the question bank and only prepare a few topic naturally what would happen is they can answer questions only on those few topics but their performance remains poor in the exam which is based on all the topics got it so they have completely ignored what what questions are being given what data points are being given to them and they just have some you know a very very strong bias or some strong prejudice that they only prepare for a, only prepare a few topics and obviously their performance will not be that great in the exam so that happens uh, that is very similar to the underfitting problem that we see in machine learning and the third category was right fit where we have the model of the right capacity and it also utilizes the training data effectively right you can see that again these are the points and this is a model it's a polynomial model but it uses the degree of the polynomial just right to get a good fit to all the points and again not really overfitting the uh, you know the training data and you can see again uh, the learning curve in this case both learning curves again start with high loss but with time both of these learning curves they come down uh, systematically gradually they come down and at the end both training and validation losses are low right they are close and they are low so this is a sign that your model is fitting uh, correctly to the training set right so what you need to do is you need to always look at these learning curves when your model is getting trained or after your model is trained to check out you know what is the how the model uh, is likely to perform the right fit here would mean the kids prepare questions from the question bank and also prepare similar questions on other concepts and try to understand the basics right so they had a holistic way of looking at the syllabus uh, given the question bank 
and you know naturally they are likely to do well in the exam as they have taken into account the syllabus as well as given data which was a question bank and they try to generalize that and because of which uh, you know they, they could perform well and same is the story with our machine learning model right. So machine learning model has you know the model of right capacity which does not overfit to the training data but it tries to generalize uh, generalize uh, based on the available training examples right and that that is reflected in the learning curve so learning curves is something that you have to keep a close eye on you know during the training or after the model is trained when you keep a close eye on learning curves while model is getting trained you can actually do early diagnosis and if the model is let's say showing any signs of underfitting or overfitting you can take corrective actions. So let's try to see what kind of corrective actions you can take when the model is overfitting or underfitting. So let's look at fixing these problems. Let's study how we can fix the underfitting problem. The underfitting is caused due to lack of representation capacity or power in the model. One simple way to enhance capacity is by adding polynomial features. That means we can essentially add let's say polynomial features of different degrees from the existing features and we will study how to incorporate the polynomial features you know in the data preprocessing video as well as in the linear regression video where we will train polynomial regression model to you know to fit the training data which is which has got nonlinear patterns. You know there could be other problem where model may have enough representation capacity but you know we are applying a large regularization rate that can also cause overfitting you know we have not studied regularization yet but you can keep in mind that regularization is a concept or is a term that is added to the loss function of the model in order to control its capacity right so it is in some sort of a penalty term and if we use too much of penalty on a model with adequate representation power it can also cause harm right it can also cause it to underfit so there are two possibilities one is model simply does not have enough capacity or model in spite of having decent capacity is you know we have applied a very high regularization rate that can cause overfitting so remember these two causes in mind and you know getting more data won't help us to fix these problems because model just does not have enough capacity. On the other hand, overfitting is caused by excess representation capacity in the model. Right? So model has so much of capacity that it can pretty much memorize the training set and you know and it can produce the uh, you know it can produce almost like perfect results on the training set but it cannot perform that well on the unseen example because it has not generalized right it has not generalized the training set with you know with the with the model so how can we fix the overfitting you know one of the simple idea is to bring in more data because once you bring in more data you know at some point in time model will run out of its capacity and then you know it can no more do a uh, it can no more take an easy route of remembering everything and reproducing it so it will have to you know start looking to generalize right by optimizing the loss function second idea is you can introduce regularization right you can you can add a penalty term to avoid overfitting right and in case you are already using overfitting you should increase the regularization rate or you should increase the coefficient or the weight to the penalty term right once you increase the weight of the penalty term you know automatically you know the model capacity will get reduced right so there are these two ways to fix it right so if your model is underfitting and if people are saying that get more data so that is not correct right if your model is underfitting getting more data is not useful getting more data is useful only when your model is overfitting got it so keep that in mind please so you know in in the first part of the evaluation we looked at in the problems uh, faced by the model or what kind of problems model would run into like overfitting and underfitting we we understood or we discussed about how to diagnose those problems 
and ways to fix those problems. Right? After you know fixing these problems, we finally get a model and we need to you know publish what kind of performance the model has on the evaluation data set or sometimes even on the unseen data set and for that we use different metrics right and these metrics differ from problem type to problem type so for regression there are different matrices and for classification there are different matrices so we will now study these matrices in detail so we mainly use two metrics uh, two matrices for a regression problem one is mean squared error and second is mean absolute error so mean squared error in a simple term what it does is it calculates the difference between the predicted value and the actual value of the output right so this is a predicted label and this is the actual label and again remember we are using y hat so y hat we will always use to denote the predicted label right and this uh, superscript i over here it shows the prediction for ith example right this is the prediction for ith example and this is the actual value of the ith example and we are taking a difference between the predicted value or predicted label and the actual label we are squaring it up and then we are summing up this squared difference over all n uh, examples that are there in the training set or maybe in the validation set or test set you can calculate this metric on any set that you desire and you know what we do is we average this particular uh, error right we average this error across an example so when we average you know we can for, we can actually report a uniform matrix for uh, sets of different sizes got it the mean absolute error on the other hand instead of squaring up the differences we just take the absolute value of the of the difference and then we sum it up across all the examples and then take average of it so that is mean absolute error right so these are two metrics that are used for uh, regression for classification there are bunch of metrics one is precision second is recall then f1 score which is harmonic mean of precision and recall then there are you know uh, other metrics which are called as auc which is area under the curve of ROC curve which is receiver operating characteristics and second is area under the curve and that curve is precision recall curve. So there are two curves that we will plot one is receiver operating characteristics and second is precision recall curve and we will calculate area under those curves. We will we'll see in detail how to plot these curves and calculate the area under the curve. Okay. You may be wondering why accuracy is not the best metric for classification. So accuracy is something where we take examples and we check what percentage of examples are predicted correctly, right? What in what percentage of example the label is correctly predicted and that becomes an accuracy of the model. But accuracy is not an ideal metric whenever we have imbalance in the label set, right? So let's say if we have 70% of examples from one class, let's say we have 70% example showing uh, cats and let's say 30% examples uh, are from class dog or class 0 for example whatever right we we say class 1 class 0 class cat class dog right or any any such kind of classes so the point is that 70% examples are from one class and 30% examples come from the other class so there is naturally an imbalance in the in the training set and now you know if we do not do any uh, efforts and simply label all examples with the label of the majority class right which is class 1 in this case then what accuracy would you get think about it for a minute of course it is on your screen but you know don't look at the screen and try to you know think about it right so yeah you got it right so 70% accuracy is what we will get right because 70% examples come from one class so you can easily get 70% accuracy. Now this could be misleading because we have not learned you know the classifier itself but we have what is called as no skill classifier which is you know simply applying label of the majority class to all the examples correct. So, so that is why accuracy is not the best metric and we will see what are alternatives that are available to us you know um, uh, in, in few slides.
So, what we do is instead of calculating accuracy, we uh, you know we arrange our uh, you know confusion in the model or the mistakes that model is making in form of what is called as confusion matrix. Literally, it is a confusion that is what confusion matrix captures. Right? So, confusion matrix has got you know two sides to it. On the rows, you have got actual predictions and on the columns, you have got predicted outputs or predicted labels. Right? So, these are actual labels on the rows and predicted labels on the column. Right? And now, this is a false label and this is a true label for example. Right? So, if the actual label is 0 and predicted label is 0, we call it as true negative. Okay? If actual label is 0 and predicted label is 1, it is called as false positive. Okay? Then actual label is true and predicted label is false. So, it is actually 1 but we predicted it to be false, right? to be 0, then this is called as false negative. And when both actual and predicted labels are 1, we call it as true positive. So, the way you should think about them, I mean these terms are sometimes confusing and people get confused whenever you know these terms are uttered. So, I have a very simple way of remembering them. So, the second part, right, second part of, of these names, it corresponds to the label in the predicted output right so this is a negative label which is zero and this is true negative right so this is a negative label it is from the predicted sense and this denotes whether both the labels in the training uh, in in the prediction and in the actual whether they match got it so this is true negative here you can see that the label is predicted to be false uh, is predicted to be to be one so that's why we call it as positive and we know that this is false prediction. So, this is positive, but it is a false prediction. Now, let us take another example. The actual label is 1, predicted label is 0. So, we know that this prediction is false. So, that is why this is false and this prediction is negative. So, it is a it is predicted in the negative class and it is false, right. It is a false prediction, though it is predicted in the negative class, it is a false prediction. That is why it is a false negative. And look at here. The actual label is 1, predicted label is 1. So, you know that since the predicted label is 1, we will write here positive and since both of them match, it is true positive. Got it? So, this is how I remember it and I find it very useful to make sense of these words. So, you know again, we will we'll go through it. So, true positive is the one which is of great interest to us because these are the examples where we got uh, the predictions correct right in the positive class. So, we have a positive class and all the predictions that we are making in the positive class, how many of them are correct will be denoted, uh, will be actually captured in this particular cell. Okay? And of course, this is a desired outcome, right? actual label is 1 and predicted label is also 1 that is a desired outcome. Now, this is another desired outcome where actual label is 0 and we also predict it to be 0, but it is called as true negative. It's a, it, it is predicted in the negative class and it is a true uh, prediction that is why it is a true negative. right? So, true negative are those examples where both the actual and predicted labels are 0, which is again a desired outcome and it is count, it is actually captured in this TN cell okay, or true negative cell. We'll, we will refer to these um, you know these terms using shortcuts. So, true negative is called Tn, false positive is called Fp, false negative will be referred to as Fn and true positive will be referred to as Tp. Okay? Then let us look at Fps or false positives. So, false positive is an error right? because the actual label is 0 and the predicted label is 1. Right? So, this is wrongly predicted to be positive by the model. right? And this is another error uh, where model is predicting the, the true label or the example for class 1 as class 0. right? So, this is a false prediction and it is predicted to be negative. right? So, it is a false negative or Fn. Now, we will make use of 
these four numbers to come up with different metrics. So the first one is precision which is the ratio of correctly predicted positives by the total predicted positives. Right? So these are correctly predicted positives which is the p and these are these are total pr predicted positive. Right? So both of them are predicted to be positive. Here they are true positive the prediction is correct and here they are predicted to be positive but that prediction is false. Got it? So precision is the ratio of correctly predicted positives by the total predicted positives or in other word it is a percentage of corrective correct positives identified correct correct positive examples identified right percentage of correct positive examples identified is called precision the second metric is recall where we uh, where we calculate the ratio of correctly predicted positives to the to the actual uh, positives right so so what are the actual positives the ones that are correctly predicted and the ones that are uh, falsely marked as negative right so those are actual positives in the in the training set so these are so the denominator here you know denotes the total number of positive examples in the training set and these are the correctly predicted positive examples you know where we are getting the predictions right got it so that is tp so tp by tp plus fn is recall so in other word it is percentage of actual positive examples correctly classified okay so we also take you know we also define another metric called f1 score which is a harmonic mean of precision and recall and it is it is computed as follows f1 is 2 into ratio of precision into recall by precision plus recall okay now typically what happens in classification is model will not output the class directly but instead of that it will mostly output the probability of a positive class right so then our job becomes we need to decide a probability threshold above which all examples are positive and on the other side all examples are negative the ones that are not passing the threshold are basically uh, we'll predict them to be negative examples so you know when we calculate when we actually uh, you know uh, calculate the confusion matrix and then different metrics based on the confusion matrix what happens is that we are we are actually taking one threshold and at that threshold we are assigning the labels to the examples and based on that we are constructing the confusion matrix right but instead of just evaluating the classifier at a particular threshold it will be useful to you know understand the overall behavior of the classifier across different probability across different probability thresholds right so instead of just taking 0.5 why 0.5 is the best threshold we do not know right so we want to know if i choose different thresholds let's say between 0 to 1 you know we want to look at at every threshold how the classifier is performing got it so we will we will see a process for uh, for carrying out this task so let's first look at the precision recall curve. So what we'll do is we will fix a probability threshold and for every threshold we'll calculate the value of precision and recall and then we'll plot a curve. Okay. Let's look at the steps involved in the process. We'll first fix the probability threshold say R. Then we get predictions for positive and negative classes as per R. Remember that you know any uh, any uh, prediction that is above r will be called positive and below r is called as negative because r is our probability threshold then we'll calculate confusion matrix at this threshold and we calculate precision and recall we store this matrix for that threshold that we simply denote at a particular threshold this was the precision and this was the recall and we choose multiple r's between 0 to 1 and for each value of r we calculate precision and recall values okay and we plot these values in ascending order of r and this chart is called as a pr curve let's look at an example of a pr curve so you can see that we have precision on our 
x-axis and recall on our y-axis. Okay, and as you can see that as as precision increases, recall drops, right? And vice versa, as recall increases, precision drops, right? So that 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 is the relationship. So there is a trade-off between precision and recall, and we plot values of precision and recall for each probability threshold from 0 to 1 and they are they're in the ascending order. So, you know, the, the values of precision recall that you see on the left side is for lower probability thresholds and uh, uh, towards the right side we have values of precision and recall on, a, on higher probability thresholds, right? So, so, we will start with 0 and we will gradually move towards 1 uh, for thresholds, got it? So, this is how we calculate the PR curve. Let us look at how ideal PR curve looks like, right. So, so before doing that, let us see the metric based on PR curve. So, we are interested in calculating area under this PR curve because this actually gives us how the classifier performs across different thresholds. So, we calculate AUC or area under the PR curve to measure the effectiveness of the model across different thresholds. This is called as AUCPR in short. And this is how the ideal classifier looks like, right? Ideal classifier would have precision and recall of 1 at every threshold in the, uh, you know, in the probability space, right? So, whatever threshold we choose, we have precision of 1 and recall of 1. So, that is our ideal classifier. And ideal classifier has area under the curve of 1, right? Because we have some kind of a square which is 1 by 1 square and area under this square will be 1, right? So, ideal classifier would have area under the curve 1, right? So, any classifier which is showing AUCPR close to 1 are a good classifier. And we will also look at how a no skill or random classifier behaves. So, the random classifier or no skill classifier, we have a horizontal line at precision equal to percentage of the majority class, right? So, in the previous example we saw where we saw that 70 percent examples come from the majority class. So, the no skill classifier will have uh, you know area of the area under curve of 0 0.7 because we will draw a line uh, a horizontal line at, at precision equal to percentage of the majority class and for a balance setting as you see in the figure for a balance setting where we have 50 percent positive examples and 50 percent negative examples this is how the no skill or random classifier will look like, right? So, there is a line, horizontal line at 0.5, right? Which is, you know, which is the percentage of a majority class, right? Here, both of them are majority class. So, 0.5, uh, there we, we will see a line, horizontal line at 0.5 for a no skill or a random classifier and uh, the AUCPR will be 0.5, right? So, if you are getting AUCPR uh, you know, closer to 1, that is what is the ideal classifier and you should always try to get better than the random classifier. Then only you can conclude that, you know, the classifier is learning. If that is not happening, then your classifier is not learning and then there is some problem uh, either in the feature representation or in your loss function or the model that you have chosen or it could also be in the optimization procedure that you have not trained for enough iterations or our learning rate was too low. So, we need to essentially debug what is the problem with our model and go back and try to fix it, okay. There is another curve that we plot which is based on the true positive rate and false positive rates. We will see, uh, you know, what are uh, these two uh, metrics stand for and ROC is the receiver operating characteristic. So, we have again a very similar curve like a PR curve which is again plotted by uh, you know choosing different probability threshold at different probability threshold here instead of precision recall we calculate false positive rate and true positive rate and then we will essentially plot them, okay. We will uh, we'll check more details about it. A PR is false positive rate and it is calculated as FP by FP plus TN. In other words, it is 1 minus specificity which is a true negative rate and TPR is true positive rate which is very similar to our recall which is in fact our recall metric that we calculated earlier. 
it is also called as sensitivity or true positive rate and it is defined as tp by tp by tp plus fn okay we plot fpr and tpr in the ascending order of probability threshold to get this roc curve we calculate area under the roc curve in order to measure the performance of the classifier and obviously the higher the area the better is the performance the ideal roc classifier has area of 1 and a random or no skill classifier has auc of 0.5 so if your classifier is learning something its auc curve should be above this diagonal line if your auc curve is below this uh, below this diagonal line then our classifier is worse than the random classifier uh, we are just not learning anything or we are not even you know using the common sensical uh, information available in training set that would mean that if your auc curve is somewhere in this particular zone but if your auc is in this zone above the random classifier we can say that our classifier is learning something and if your classifier is ideal if it has so if it traces this particular path if it rises up sharply and then it stays over here then that's an ideal classifier it will have area under the curve close to 1 so good classifiers or classifiers with some skills learned from the training examples are expected to have auc roc greater than 0.5 for balanced class setting where we have 50% examples from one class and 50% from the other class or if we are in a multi class setting we have equal roughly equal number of examples from all the class that's a balanced classification setting we prefer auc roc as a major of performance but if we have imbalanced classification setting where the imbalance is moderate to large we generally prefer auc pr as a metric to measure the performance of the classifier so this uh, brings us to the end of abstract sketch videos and in this video what we did is we talked about different components of machine learning framework and what kind of role that they play in the uh, in the machine learning process so you know uh, now you have good idea about the theory of this framework and the machine learning process and now uh, henceforth in the course right we will be studying different uh, machine learning algorithm and in each machine learning algorithm you will encounter these five components and this particular process coming repetitively right so once you have all these basics covered all these basics will be applicable in each and every classifier or regressors that we learn in this course so i would urge you to you know uh, understand these basics thoroughly and you know you will you will get to a perfection or you will get more practice of this particular framework and the process as we study more and more algorithm uh, algorithms in this class okay until then uh, until then have fun learning machine learning and i will see you in the next video namaste